So here we are. So as usual, we're going to start with the candles. And since we have some new people here, I don't know how much you guys know about Messianic worship, but I know you guys know a lot about it, and you guys know a lot about it. And everybody else who's here starts with the lighting of the candles because it separates today, it separates the day from the rest of the week. You know, every feast day, every holy day starts with lighting candles. And the Shabbat is a holy day. You know, all the descriptions of the feasts of the Lord always start with the Sabbath. Always start with the Shabbat. So, we're going to light the candles. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctified us with his commandments, commanded us to be light to the nations, and who gave us Yeshua the Messiah, light to the world. Amen. Amen. And you all know that everybody needs to learn a little bit. He, uh, everybody learns needs to learn a little bit of Hebrews of Hebrew, and why is <laughs> and why is that? So when we go to heaven, we won't have culture shock. That's a quote from Walter Lieber, but, so I can't take credit for it. Okay, if you stand for the Shema, Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Baruch Shem Kavod Malkuto Leolam Vayed. Blessed be the name of his glorious kingdom forever and ever. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you today shall be upon your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. Blessed are you, Lord our God, and God of our fathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, the great, mighty, and awesome God, the most high God, who bestows grace and creates all and remembers the righteousness of the fathers and brings a redeemer to their children's children for his name's sake with love. O King, Helper, Savior, and Shield, blessed are you, O Lord, Shield of Abraham. Oof. I forgot to give her the clicker. <sighs> One technical difficulty here. <laughs> I forgot about the clicker. <clears throat> okay, we're back after technical difficulty. So for those of you keeping score at home, that was my fault. <laughs> so here we are. And over the last, I don't know, quite a few months now, the Lord's really been dealing with me about what's going on in the world, what's going on in the culture, what's going on in the church, and how not only have we sunk into the moral abyss, and not only has darkness come over, and you know, in Isaiah 5 it says, woe to you when you call evil good and good evil, when you substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter, here we are, and the shepherds, the leaders that are supposed to be shepherding us are sleeping on the wall or they've just surrendered to the world and the barbarians have come in through the gate. They don't even have to go over the walls anymore. They can just come right in the gate. And so as the church tries to be more and more like the world, the gospel has been hijacked. 
the gospels become a different gospel, like Paul talks about in Galatians 1, a different gospel which is not a gospel at all, right? There's only one gospel, which, you know, the ancient Greek word kerygma, that we talked about last week, that Jesus is God's only son. He came to die for our sins. He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven. The Holy Spirit came to fill the hearts of the faithful. He's dwelling in us now. And to embolden us to proclaim the gospel. That's the kerygma. The gospel is not about being nice to everyone. It's not about pop cans. It's not about not raising your voice. The gospel is your sins can only be forgiven by what happened at the cross. And the world doesn't want to hear that anymore. Now, you probably know in the book of Ecclesiastes, or for those of you that are old enough to remember the birds with a Y, turn, turn, turn. But, uh, <laughs> oh, Norm, you're not that. Oh, yeah, you are. <laughs> you just look a lot younger than I do. <laughs> I know how old you are. But, um, you know, the book of, that comes from the book of Ecclesiastes, and one of the great lines in Ecclesiastes is that there's nothing new under the sun. You know, what we're seeing has been seen before. There's nothing new. The difference in our time, though, is that evil is promoted, and evil is, you know, accepted as good. So when you have people that not only promote late-term abortion, but infanticide to say they're doing the Lord's work. God's patience is about to run out. And my opinion, and as I said last week, a year from now, we're going to look back on the good old days of coronavirus, because this is just the beginning. And so here we are. But this has happened before, and... The Bible commonly calls it the world religion. We know it as humanism, where man is raised up to be like a god. We create God in our own image, right? Because you have to keep in mind, Satan always creates counterfeits, right? Always creates counterfeits. God is the author of life, so Satan brings us abortion and murder and, you know, that sort of thing. God says a man and a woman are united together and they become one flesh. So Satan says, hey, it doesn't have to be a man and a woman. It can be any, any group of people even, any couple of people. God creates the nuclear family as the basis of human society. Well, we don't have to have family. We don't have to have men. We don't have to have any of that stuff. Jesus said he created them at the beginning, male and female. Well, you know, my birth certificate says I'm a male. And if you look at me, you say that's a male, but I think I'm a female. Or I think I'm one of 52 other genders, and which I can't for the life of me understand how there can be, you know, 50 genders, because I'm so old-fashioned, I think that there's two. I mean, you know, so now, you know, when a woman has a baby and... Somebody just got fired from a faculty position because he, or, I can't remember if it was a he or a she, said only women can have babies, so she got fired. So after all, you know, that violates gender politics. But, you know, so now when a baby's born and whoever's delivering the baby says, oh, congratulations, Sally, it's a girl, Sally can say, well, you say it's a girl. But later on, he or she or it can make a decision whether it's a boy or a girl. I mean, this is where we are now. This is where we are now. So we wonder why there's a pandemic. We wonder why there's violence and hatred going on. We wonder why there's unrest everywhere. You know, a lot of people think we're in chapter 6 of Revelation. You know, I don't know. I don't know. But we're somewhere along the continuum me, personally, I, like I always say, I hope he comes back tonight. But we don't know when he's coming back. But to show how this has happened before, we have to, we're going to go back tonight to talk to a man who has the courage to stand up to the world religion. Because now, 
Nobody in the church has courage to stand up to the world religion. Oh, well, what can we do? We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. We want to be tolerant. We want everybody to leave here happy on Sunday morning or Saturday morning, depending where it is. We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. You know, people have sincerely held beliefs. Well, you know, the old saying is you can be, you can feel, you can have sincere beliefs, but you can be sincerely wrong. But now, since we've gotten rid of truth with a capital T, and we have truth with little t, small t, or I guess now they call it lowercase t, we always called it small t, or, but anyway, lowercase t, whatever you think is the truth, is the truth. So what I think is true, he may not think is true. What he thinks is true, she may not think is true, but we're all three right. So how can that be? So for Jesus to say, I'm the only way to heaven, he must have been a liar, or he must have been mentally ill. He may have just been an arrogant, you know, preacher who was looking for a big audience, or he's the Lord. As C.S. Lewis said, Jesus was either a lunatic a liar, or he's Lord. But try to tell that to your friends out in the public. No one wants to hear it. Try writing that on Facebook and see the comments you get back. So the man we're going to talk about tonight is the prophet Elijah. His Hebrew name is Eliyahu. Elijah, like every other human being who's ever lived, had good points and bad points. <laughs> he was strong for the Lord in many ways. He became a coward and ran away. He became arrogant later to say, I'm the only one who's following you. And God says, Elijah, smack yourself around. You're not the only one. So shut up. Stop whining. I'm paraphrasing. But if, you under, but if you know how to read the ancient languages, that's what God said. <laughs> but we're going to do this in two parts because the song Lord God of Abraham comes from 1 Kings 18. The part that that song refers to, we're going to do next week. But this week, we're setting the stage for it because he confronts a world religion of the time. And the world religion of the time was idolatry and paganism. Pagan worship. We're not talking about pagan worship in Greece. We're not talking about pagan worship in Asia somewhere. We're not talking about primitive tribes in Europe having this. We're talking about God's people, Israel, doing this. Christians in our society now espouse any number of crazy beliefs, right? But they admit to pollsters, well, I'm a Christian, but I believe in all this stuff because there's a disconnect now, and it's not new. So if you know the history, if you know the Bible, if you know First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, you know that when Solomon died, the kingdom split. And there was a northern kingdom called Israel and a southern kingdom called Judah. The northern kingdom eventually gets overrun by the Assyrians. The southern kingdom gets overrun by the Babylonians 150 some years later. But the northern, but they each had their own kings. They were separate kingdoms. And God would send prophets from the land of Judah into the northern kingdom of Israel to preach. Elijah was one of them. Elisha, who comes after him, is one. Amos was one. And they, they were all preaching before 722 B.C. when the northern kingdom fell. It was totally trashed by the Assyrians. And people were exiled. The Assyrians moved in. And the whole area gave rise to the Samaritans. But that's another, another story. So the kings of the north were evil, and they worshipped false gods. And they married women that came from the nations. They weren't supposed to do that. God commands, don't marry people from the nations. Don't marry your neighbors. Don't do business with them. 
and especially don't go to church with them because they're going to lure you into idolatry. They're going to lure you into the false gods. And what we have now is huge numbers of people, the vast majority. This is what I always call the remnant. Now, you guys that are here are part of the remnant that still has the faith. Amen? Amen. But people out there are so poorly grounded that they'll fall for anything. They'll fall for anything. And I don't want to say just young people, because even older people are falling for things that would have been unheard of years ago. So in the northern kingdom, the kings, tonight we're going to talk about Ahab, they married pagan women against God's law. And so to keep their wives happy, they built temples to pagan gods, especially Baal, who was the main god of the area, not the God of Israel, but here you have a Hebrew king who's espousing the worship of Baal and all the other gods. In fact, we're going to see in the scripture they're called Baalim, which means many gods. So they built temples to these gods in the northern kingdom. I mean, can you imagine? How horrible this was. And God sent prophets saying, pretty soon this whole place is going to be trashed if you guys don't turn around. When the southern kingdom fell in 586 B.C., he sent Jeremiah, he sent Ezekiel, he sent, you know, all the prophets of the exile said, you guys better turn back to God or this whole place is going to be trashed. Oh, what are you talking about? You guys are nothing but a bunch of party poopers. We got the temple here. We got the priests here. We got all the stuff here. God's not going to destroy his own house. Well, he did. The priests were worshiping idols in the temple. Can you imagine? Well, I would have never thought we would see that in our day, but we did this last October. But that's going to be another day's talk. So we're going to go to 1 Kings 18. Ahab is the king, okay? He's an evil king. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord, Lord's all capitalized, so that's Yahweh, that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year saying, go, present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the earth. Okay, he tells, he tells Elijah, go to the king, and you're going to tell him something that I'm going to tell you to tell him. You're going to go and do it. You know, this group I teach on Thursday nights, last night we had this whole thing about when you hear the voice of the Lord, how do you react? Do you even realize it's the voice of the Lord? Or do you say, eh, you know, I don't want to go see King Ahab. Or, eh, you know, I'm kind of busy right now. And... I'm kind of tired right now, and, you know, i got a runny nose, and my little toe on the right hurts, so I better stay home. You know, this is the prophets of today, how they act, because we're such a bunch of sissies. So, the king had brought false worship. Not to Mesopotamians, not to all these other people, but to Israel. In fact, later, God tells Abraham, or tells Elijah, don't worry, I have 7,000 people that haven't bent their knee to Baal. Well, that sounds nice, 7,000 people. But the population of Israel at that time is estimated to be about 3 million. So out of 3 million people, there were 7,000 people that were faithful. I didn't check what, I didn't calculate the percentage of that, but it's a pretty small percentage. So the king brought the false worship. He was married to Jezebel. I mean, you can watch movies and they'll talk about Jezebel, you know, kind of comically. But, you know, there's a spirit of Jezebel in the world. And what's the spirit of Jezebel? It's the occult. It's sexual immorality. It's turning away from truth. 
It's you can be your own master. You don't have to listen to all that God stuff. You can do whatever you want. You know, all that God stuff just inhibits you. You know, God doesn't want you to have any fun. That's the spirit of Jezebel. And if you read Jonathan Kahn's book, it says the spirit of Jezebel has been in this country for a while now. <laughs> Since the early 90s, he traces it back to. Which is kind of interesting. But he's married to Jezebel. And this has spread through the whole land. And Queen Jezebel, working through her husband, cut off the true prophets. They didn't want to hear him. You know, if you read the book of Amos, the people in Israel tell Amos, hey, why don't you go back to where you came from, earn your living over there, why are you up here bothering us? We've got a king, we've got our own priests, and we've got our own temples. Temples, plural. There was only one temple, which was in Jerusalem. The only place where the sacrifices could be done. The only priests were the Levites. But the people in the north tell Amos, just go back to Judah and just live there and leave us alone. We got all this stuff. So the true prophets were cut off and many of the true believers were hiding. What's that sound like? Because the government was pursuing them. We can't have that talk about Torah. We can't have that talk about 613 laws. We can't have that talk about God actually has moral laws that we have to follow and that we're responsible for. We don't want to hear that kind of talk. And I'm not talking about New York City or L.A. or Cleveland in 2020. We're talking about before 722 B.C. See, there's nothing new under the sun. So the true believers were in hiding. And it says, after many days... So this judgment had been coming on for a while. So after many days, God sends Elijah to the king. And he calls Elijah to confront the king. You know, the, you know the song Days of Elijah. You know, that's sung mostly because it says before Messiah comes, Elijah the prophet is going to come. And it's kind of interesting because Elijah confronts the world religion and then the tradition says that he's going to, well, not tradition, the scripture says Elijah's going to come before the Messiah. So here we are. We have to be Elijah. We're living in the days of Elijah because the Messiah's coming again. Soon. I hope it's tonight. But it's going to be Soon. If we're, still in ten, if we're still here in 10 years, Pastor Monica, talking about how Jesus is going to come pretty soon, I'm going to be surprised. So Elijah goes to confront it, and he confronts it at the source. He doesn't go on Facebook and complain. He doesn't send out emails to his friends. He doesn't tweet to his friends going, I can't take this Jezebel stuff anymore. He goes right into the palace. To confront it. He goes to the source. Now, I don't know. I've been praying about how do we do that? How do we go to the source if we're going to be Elijah? You know, what is the source? Satan is the source. You know, how are we going to go to the human representative of Satan and deal with this? But anyway, he goes right to the source at a certain time. God always does things at a certain time. And you notice what's going on now since coronavirus came, it's been a time of punishment, sadness, concern, anxiety, depression. But it's also been a time of prayer, confinement. It's been like a Shabbat, a forced Sabbath, I've been calling it, if you've been watching the videos. God gives us an opportunity to come to grips with our lives. So it's a time of mercy, right? So the people like us that are in the remnant, we're getting even more focused. The people who are somewhere between warm and lukewarm are getting focused. The majority of people are going to say, oh, it'd be good when this is over with. They aren't going to change their lives at all. Let's get back to normal. Let's get back to the Jezebel stuff we were doing before. Because this coronavirus has really put a damper on the Jezebel stuff. 
And that's what we like. So at the right time this happens. Then Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts lives, God's called the Lord of hosts several times in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament. This is Yahweh Sabaoth. As the Lord of hosts lives, before whom I stand, I will surely present myself to him today, meaning the king. God is calling me to go to the king, and as sure as I'm standing here, and as sure as the Lord lives, and as sure as I stand before the Lord, I'm going to go present myself to the king today. He didn't say, well, Lord, I don't know. What can I do? Well, you know, things are, things are tough all over. Maybe we should just let it go. You know, maybe we should just say, hey, you know, that's just the way things are now. That's what the churches are saying now. Rushing to be like the world. You know, I feel like asking some of these pastors, why do you bother even having a church? Why bother? Throw the Bible away and just have, you know, feel good Sunday. You know, I love Jesus. He loves me. Isn't this nice? Okay, great. Now let's go to brunch. Or I don't think you can have brunches anymore, right? But you know what I mean. <laughs> so I'm going to present myself today. He takes the ultimate oath. What's the ultimate oath? He swears to God he's going to do it. You know, God always says in the scriptures, I swear by myself. Because he can't swear to anybody who's higher than he is. So God says, I swear by myself that I'm going to do this. You know, when you say, I swear to God this is true, and it's not true, then you've committed a horrible blasphemy, right? You've profaned the name of God. And God, you know, the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words, as they're sometimes called in Hebrew and in Greek, the Ten Commandments, you know, where it says you don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain, it says you're not going to escape punishment if you take the Lord's name in vain. You're not going to escape punishment. Because his name is his identity. And how often do you hear people blaspheming God's name in your day-to-day -day talk? So he takes the ultimate oath that he's going to do this. He's determined that he's going to follow God's direction that he has for him. Right now, he's being a courageous prophet. He's being a courageous leader. He's going to be a little bit of a wuss later on. But right now, he's being courageous. And he represents the ultimate authority. He's going to the king representing God. He's not representing himself. He's not representing the high priest who's in Jerusalem. And they had their own priesthood of some kind. I don't remember all the details. So he's not representing any of these guys or any of these sort of human institutions. He's not representing some local government. He's representing God who's the ultimate authority. And he's willing to take the message. He's willing to do it. We're not even willing to tell our neighbor about Jesus because we're afraid he's going to think we're a kook. You know, I always grocery shop at the same place. And there was a cashier there who I kind of got to be friends with. And, you know, we'd exchange pleasantries and, you know, talk about stuff. And so one day I tried to evangelize her. And she hasn't talked to me anymore. And the guy who was behind me in line was going, come on, let's go. Get your stuff. Put your stuff in the bag. Let's go. And I go, wait a minute. You need to hear this too. I don't want to hear anything. I just want to pay for my stuff and get out of here. So now when I go to the same grocery store, say hello to her, she kind of goes. Because she was offended, offended that I said she needs to know Jesus. That doesn't hurt my feelings, right? Elijah doesn't care if his feelings are going to get hurt. If you're worried about your feelings... You're not carrying the message. You know, Jesus said, if the world loves you, forget it. The world's going to hate you because it hates me. So, 
17. Then it happened when Ahab saw Elijah. It's funny how you could just like walk into the palace. You know, there was like no secret service or <laughs> no uh, body scanners, no metal detectors. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? Now, doesn't that sound like today? You Christians are the ones that are causing the trouble. Shut up. You people are narrow-minded. You're bigots. You're intolerant. We want to have our own rebellion. We want to tell God, this is how we're going to live. Who remembers last year, I can't remember what month it was, when the New York State Legislature passed the not only unlimited abortion till the very moment that the baby was due, but if the baby somehow survived it, you would just let the baby die. Well, Cuomo comes in and signs the bill. He jumps out of his seat. Everybody's clapping. Everybody's dancing around. Everybody's high-fiving each other. And that night, they lit the Freedom Tower. Interesting that it's called the Freedom Tower. To celebrate this great victory. Because now we'll decide who's going to be born. And we'll decide when they're going to be born. And we'll decide if they're going to live. Because now we're free. So light up the thing and dance. You know, when we started going to Mexico in the mid-90s, there was not even a divorce law in Mexico because marriage was such a sacred thing. Now, not only is there divorce, there's unlimited abortion, same-sex marriage, all the stuff we have. That's all happened in 25 years. It's happening everywhere. Ireland passed a referendum to allow abortion. They never had abortion. They were under terrific pressure from the European Union because they're members. You have to have abortion. You have to have abortion. So they had a referendum and it passed overwhelmingly. So people in Dublin, um, 100,000 people turned out in the middle of Dublin and partied all night because the referendum had passed. Fireworks, drinking, dancing, because now we can kill our babies. Now we have freedom. We don't want to hear any of this God stuff anymore. We want to do what we want to do. Troubler of Israel. You stand up, abortion is only one example, right? But it's a horrendous example. Horrendous example. But if you say anything, you're the troubler of the society. You're trying to restrict my freedom. Who are you to tell me that? So he calls him troubler of Israel. So he's the troubler of the nation because he's speaking against our rebellion. You know, Governor Cuomo says, if you don't believe in unlimited abortion, if you don't believe in same-sex marriage, don't come to New York. I said, okay. Yesterday made one year since I had a cup of Starbucks. Because last July 2nd, their CEO said, if you believe in traditional marriage, don't drink our coffee. So I said, okay. I won't drink their coffee then. As much as I love it, I'm not going to give them the money. I mean, it's not going to matter in the long run, but it's a personal statement. So they're speaking against the rebellion. You're trying to tell us that we're wrong? And you're trying to tell us there's a higher power that's going to judge us? We'll decide what we're going to do. It's Tower of Babel stuff. We'll decide what we're going to do. We want to rule. Who first said that? Lucifer. I don't want to serve. I want to rule. Right? Saul Alinsky said Lucifer was the first rebel. He was the first revolutionary. 
Saul Alinsky's whole philosophy has, has come into every movement, into the government, into the churches. And he said Lucifer was the first revolutionary. So does that mean we should pattern ourselves after Lucifer? Well, that's what we're doing. So don't tell me about higher powers. Don't question what we do and how we worship, or even what we worship. Don't tell us we can't have gods that are convenient for us. We throw our children into the fire to the god Moloch. That's what abortion is. It's the Moloch worship from this time that's come back. They put a statue of Moloch up in Central Park that day too, I should add, of the abortion ruling, of, of the abortion decision, um, law. The god Moloch, who would think of the god Moloch? But you threw your children into the fire in front of the statue of Moloch so you'd have good luck. So you're trying to tell us we can't have gods of convenience? We don't want to be talking about all that old stuff. Because nobody thinks like that anymore. Maybe God believed that 3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, maybe even 1,000 years ago, but he certainly can't believe that now. After all, we've evolved. After all, you know, we've become, you know, our own gods. Because we'll decide what's true, and we'll decide what's right. I don't know if you were in the, I don't think you were in the office the day that this young drug rep, you know, it was Christmas time. So I was telling her, you know, what does she do for Christmas? And, you know, how do you celebrate the birth of the Messiah? And she was like, oh, well, you know, blah, blah, blah. Then when I said something like God has a moral law that we're obliged to follow, she started laughing at me. And I mean laughing. I mean, it's like a 25-year-old, you know, drug rep. And, you know, when somebody laughs at me, I get mad. I mean, I have an Italian temper, she can tell you. I mean, if somebody laughs at me, I get mad. But, you know, instead of getting mad, I sat back in my chair and I looked at this woman and I thought, how pathetic is this? She has no clue what I'm talking about. Not a clue. So nobody thinks like that anymore. We have our freedom now. We'll decide what's true. And there's new ways to think we're free of all that stuff. And it's about time that we're free of all that stuff. You know, I went to public school, and every morning we had a Bible reading along with the Pledge of Allegiance, and I don't remember what else we did. But, you know, there was an old King James Bible in every classroom of the public school. And people took turns in the morning reading some, you know, passage that somebody picked out. You know, you're a little kid. Then that got pulled, and prayer got pulled. Now the kids are indoctrinated to, we don't want to know any of that stuff anymore. And he answered, this is Elijah, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the Baals. You've forsaken God, you're following the false gods, you, your majesty, and your family are the ones that have troubled the nation, not me. I'm here to try to make it right. I'm here to try to get you to understand what you're doing. I'm not the troubler. When you confront your friends, when you confront these people on TV, you say, I'm, well, of course, I yell at the TV, as she can tell you, which is really kind of pointless. But, but when you confront these people today, try to make them understand they're the ones that have caused these problems. I mean, they won't believe it. They won't change their mind. But you know, they won't change their mind. But Elijah says, I'm not the one who's caused the problem. You're the one who caused the problem. The problem's not with Elijah. Today's problem's not with us. 
We've got Bibles. We have churches. We have prayer groups. We have home groups. We have Bible study groups. We're grounded in the faith. We're standing on the rock. We're living in a house built on a rock, not built on shifting sand. Right? I hope we are. Can I get an amen? So the problem is not with us. Today's problem is not because of us. With what we believe. You know, when the Crusaders were on their way to the Holy Land, they stopped in Constantinople. They sacked the city. They stole everything. They raped. They killed. Then they got to Jerusalem, and they killed Muslims. They killed Jews. They destroyed stuff. And they were there because they wanted the Christians to control the Holy Land. And that's how they behaved. You know, humans are defective. <laughs> But we know the truth. The problem is not with the truth. The problem is not with the word, your majesty. The problem is with you and your family. You've led us into this. You've rebelled against God's law. We've rebelled against God's law. It's a parallel to today, right? We don't want the law. Ahab didn't want the law either. He wanted Jezebel to be happy. You've made idols of convenience. We've made idols of convenience. Reminds me of when Mother Teresa came to Washington. I don't remember what year it was, but Bill Clinton was president, and uh, Bill Clinton and Al Gore met her at the airport. And they were all excited they were going to meet Mother Teresa. So they went up to, you know, this little old lady who starts going like this with her finger. And you can't hear what she's saying, but what she's saying is, you guys are in favor of abortion. You're killing your children. You're violating God's law. If you don't want your children, send them to me. And what are Clinton and Gore going to say? Uh -huh. Then when they probably got back in their limousine, they said, what a kooky old lady. So we've made idols of convenience. They made idols of convenience. We've made gods in our image. The God I believe in would never do that. The God I believe in would never send anybody to hell. Jesus loves everybody. Yes, of course. But he loves you enough that he wants to change you. Jesus talked about hell four times more than he talked about heaven in the Gospels. Four times more. So if hell's not a real place, or if nobody goes there, why was Jesus talking about it so much? So, so we've made gods in our image. So the troubles are made by the people that are under judgment, not by the people who understand why they're under judgment. But the society's turned that around. Turn the blame around. Woe to you when you call evil good and good evil. So it's not, the trouble's not with the people following the word. The problem is with the scandal and sin that's condoned by the authorities. You know, when you promote a sin, you're guilty of, of a worse charge than just committing the sin because you're promoting it. You're saying, this is good. I want everybody to do this. You know, if I was a thief and came here and said, you know, it's great to be a thief. You guys all should try it. Steal as much money as you can. Knock over the little old lady out there, take her purse. It's great to steal stuff. You would think, what a weirdo. But if you promote these gross moral abnormalities, you're a hero. You're a hero. So Elijah's basically telling them the truth is for the benefit of the nation. I'm here to bring blessing back to the nation, to bring the right relationship with God, and for God to bless them, not to punish them. The clock is ticking. His patience is coming to an end.
And if you don't see what's going on, you know, somebody I watched on YouTube the other day made a great point. I can't remember who it was now, but he said, if you don't see the spiritual warfare going on, you're already a casualty. <laughs> you know, you can't just say, oh, well, you know, I go most of the time and this is all nice and I love my pastor and, you know, that priest over there is real nice and those days are over. The time for church, as usual, is over. So the prophet shows the problem, gives the warning, and shows them where they're gone. And then tells them what's coming. The judgment is coming. Whether you believe it or not. If you say you don't believe in the law of gravity, well, that's nice, but if you jump off the roof of your house, you're going to hit the ground. Whether you believe that you're going to hit the ground or not. So he says judgment is coming. And it's not, Elijah is not a mute church. The church today is mute. I don't care what denomination you're in. Do you hear anybody from any denomination saying anything? They're all mute. Oh, I don't know. Oh. I don't know. Now, when I was a kid, we had nuns with rulers and paddles. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So when, when you, quote, transgress the law, you got immediate judgment. <laughs> I never got hit on the knuckles, but I got hit on the rear end quite a few times. And I went to public school. <laughs> so it's not a mute church. Elijah's not a mute church. He confronts the evil at its source. And next week, we're going to continue with what happens to Elijah, how he confronts the evil again in a very powerful way. So, any questions? Yes, I read it. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, they both said he's our he's our mentor. And it's you know, and that's what's infiltrated the church. And you know, if you read that book, you know, it was written what in the six, mid six early sixties, mid sixties, but there's specific chapters in there about how they have to infiltrate the church, especially the Catholic Church, and they have to put people in position that are gonna start to tear it down. And they have to put people in positions that are going to make the people in the church lose confidence in the church. And that this is how the revolution's going to come. You have to destroy the churches first. Uh, rules for a radical. So, he was a Jew. So, he was an agnostic or an atheist. But Any other comments, questions, concerns? I got a lot of concerns. I'm sorry? Oh, SWATs? Oh. Mostly for being a smart aleck. Imagine that. <laughs> Imagine that. Bend over, hold your ankles. I still remember what it felt like when you got the whack and then you kind of went, <laughs> but you didn't want to show your friends that you were in pain, so you just kind of went. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wood shop. Oh, I got a, quite a few wax in wood shop. Seventh grade. Yeah, I still remember the teacher. Monica.
Yep. Amen. So let's close with the ironic blessing and then whoever wants to talk can talk. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he let his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift his countenance before you and give you his peace, his true shalom that surpasses all understanding that the world cannot give. And we ask this in the name of the Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace. Amen.